Hello, everybody. I'm Phil Brandt, President and CEO at AIM Employers Association, and welcome to This Week at Work. Welcome to This Week at Work, the only show to pack workplace news, practical HR solutions, and timely insights into every 30-minute episode. It's Thursday, October 17th, episode 300. Today, we rest on our laurels just a tad while conquering our 300th episode, but not for long because we have our special guest Tanya Zion wrapping up our employee opinion series with part three, Emerging Leader Mentorship and how it's leading to burnout. This show is brought to you by AIM Employers Association, live every Thursday morning, so you can regularly connect with their experts and get your legal questions addressed by Ogletree Deacons. And now, it's time for This Week at Work. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back, Bert. It's good to have the band together. Back with me, as always, is Bert Garland. Good morning, Bert. Good morning, Phil. I'm I'm, I'm excited today. Today's uh, episode 300. Amazing. I know. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you think about 300 episodes and how we started um, just, you know, saying, hey, people need some help during COVID and let's see if we can uh, provide some clarity on what it means to be an essential employer and whether you should shut down or not. And I mean, we spent hours uh, every single day working to to help people do that. And here we are 300 episodes later. Uh, I, I'm I'm happy. I'm so happy to be a part of that success with you and and with producer Nick in the background and and uh, our VP of marketing Tim Sater and the work that he's doing behind the scenes that no one sees. But most importantly, I'm just I'm just happy we're able to help people. You know, I mean, the number of viewers and the popularity of the program and the help that I continue to hear people get from the program makes it all worthwhile to me. I agree. I'm I'm happy to be part of it, Phil, and uh, thank you and and Nick for all the hard work. It's been uh, a, a a labor of love. Yeah, that that's for sure. Um, I want to just Nick. I don't know um, if the audience is looking at this uh, picture here of Bert in his sweater vest, and um, I thought I saw one where we were Spartans, and I kind of liked the Spartan picture a little bit better. Uh, I, I noticed how you up just mentioned picture? it was just you, but you know. I mean, just Bert, but you're also in that photo too. I, you know, it's kind of hard to miss. Yeah, that I think you and Monique had something to do with that. Anybody that knows me knows I'm not a sweater vest guy. Um, now that, there you go. That's, now we're talking. That's the image I have of myself in my mind is more <laughs> of that Spartan. Yeah. Tanya, what are you shaking your head? Good morning, Tanya. Welcome back to the program for part three. I mean, you wouldn't agree? I am just always in stitches with the two of you, and I am very honored and excited to be here for episode 300. It's always great to start the day with a laugh. Yeah, well, you she's you laughing know, at you us right well. through that very well. <laughs> Somehow, maybe you're saying probably not uh, uh, sweater vest, probably not Spartan body either. So we'll just go with um, we're just trying to help people, right? We're here to help. I like it. I, they say men think about the Roman Empire all the time. So maybe that ties back to the Spartan. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really sure. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So uh, we're just really happy to be celebrating our 300th episode. We are going to go with program as normal because that's what you want to hear about, Bert. We're going to kick things off with lawyer on the clock. But before we do that, so you don't have to remind me, um, I must have a, a poll question here. I do. Over the past 300 episodes, what has been your most memorable moment for you? We have, uh, you remember the updates on the Corona Squirrel, Bert, that was really popular. Um, you, was you had your popular. broadcast from Jerusalem. I remember that from the top of the uh, building there in Jerusalem. That was a fun episode. Uh, we had a, a fishing uh, excursion uh, at Lake of the Ozarks, and I was broadcasting from the boat. Um, I remember when Monique got high on the program, and she was a little difficult to deal with. Um, or there could be others, and we'd like to hear your uh, feedback on that. So just a little bit of a fun question for those of you that have been with us along the journey. Uh, so I'd like to get your feedback on that. Bert, you ready for Lawyer on the Clock? I'm ready, Phil. I got to tell you, it's one of our most popular segments. Bert, let's go. Nick, pull that lever. All right, it's time to look into what's trending in employment law. Lawyer, you're on the clock. 
Three topics I want to cover today. The first is that uh, earlier this month, the U.S. Supreme Court accepted review of a case called Ames versus Ohio Department of Youth Services. And what the Supreme Court is going to consider in this case is how to uh, resolve a split in the federal circuit courts on the standard that those courts apply in discrimination claims brought by majority group plaintiffs. So think of reverse discrimination claims, uh, white white uh, individuals bringing race discrimination claims, males bringing uh, gender or sex discrimination claims. So Bert, is that really reverse discrimination or is it just discrimination in another way? Well, I think that's well, what- Not the, in how we normally think of it. I'm just- Yeah, no, I think that's what the court's going to tackle, Phil. Typically the courts have used what's called the McDonnell Douglas test, uh, for evaluating discrimination claims under Title VII. That case goes all the way back to 1973. That test has some variations, but generally uh, under that test, a plaintiff has to prove that they're a member of a protected class, that they were subjected to an adverse employment action, that the individual was qualified to perform the job in question, and that the employer treated the individual, uh, uh, treated similarly situated employees outside the protected class more favorably. Okay. And under that burden shifting method, if that, uh, or framework, if the plaintiff proves those four elements, uh, the burden then shifts to the defendant to show a valid non-discriminatory reason for the adverse employment action. If the defendant makes that showing, the burden then shifts back to the plaintiff uh, to uh, to establish that that non just non discriminatory reason is a pretext for discrimination. So that's generally the test. Okay. Uh, in addition to those McDonnell Douglas factors, there are many courts in reverse discrimination claims that have required the majority uh, group plaintiff to show quote background circumstances to support the suspicion that the defendant is that unusual employer who discriminates against the majority. Okay, so wow, that's that what, sounds like a lot of loose words to me. Suspicion, unusual, yeah. Yeah, yeah and so what the court here uh, is, is basically going to have to tackle here is that uh, the federal circuits are deeply split on whether to apply this background circumstances test to majority group claims. And really it adds an onerous burden uh, that it makes that that the plaintiff in this case is arguing that if the courts apply this onerous burden, the courts themselves are engaging in discrimination against the majority group plaintiffs. And so this ties into a case that we've talked about quite extensively on the show. The Supreme Court stated recently in that case in Muldrow versus the city of St. Louis uh, that, uh, quote, eliminating discrimination means eliminating all of it, end quote. And so what they're going to tackle here is, should there be this extra standard added? Uh, and that gets to your point, Phil, is it just discrimination? Should there be an added standard uh, when it's a, a, a member of a majority group that is accusing the employer of harassment, I'm sorry, yeah. discrimination? And so my gut tells me on this one that the court's going to do away with that something more standard, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll keep an eye on that one. It's gonna that can be uh, that can change a lot of things depending on the ruling of that. So it can, and I think it could really impact employers' DE and I efforts as well. So we're really gonna have to keep an eye on that. Yeah. All right. Okay, so the next one I have there, Mr. Lawyer on the clock. Yeah, the next one I have for you here is uh, this one relates to uh, UPS United Parcel Service, and they have filed a litigation uh, in a federal court in Delaware where they are telling the Delaware court they're seeking a, uh, a an emergency uh, temporary restraining order and a preliminary injunction preventing OSHA from enforcing some subpoenas, I'm sorry, some, some warrants at two of its facilities in Delaware. And uh, so, so I'm not citing the case, and I'm not gonna get into the specific facts of the case, but one of the things we've talked about repeatedly on the show is what to do when the government comes knocking, whether it be OSHA, the Department of Labor, uh, showing up for a wage and hour audit, uh, or anything about having to uh, 
uh, any anything, you know, the EEOC shows up, any of those agencies showing up at your door and sort of flashing their badges around and sort of demanding to come into the employer's premises. And I've always said, treat the governmental official politely, take them into a conference room, don't walk them through the facility and get your legal counsel on the phone because you're entitled to representation during these inspections. The other thing I've always said though is, is that when somebody shows up with a warrant, that's a different ball game. Uh, that means they've already gone to court and the court has ordered an inspection and there is a, an ability to redress that legally through an emergency filing with the courts through a temporary restraining order uh, or a, a preliminary injunction. But just know that when they show up, unless they have that warrant and they uh, are authorized by a court to access your premises, then generally uh, you have the right to have them uh, come back at a time that's mutually convenient for you, your legal counsel. And just remember, employers have rights too, all right? Yeah. And then the last one I wanted to talk about, Phil, I think you'll like this one. I don't know. Something tells me you'll like this. Uh, there, there's a case that- uh, It always it worries me when you kick it <laughs> off with, I'm going to like this one. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see here. So so there's a case uh, that, that was decided in the last couple of days uh, out of Washington Federal Court. And what this court was doing was it was reviewing the uh, award of an arbitration board that was comprised of uh, union members and company members of Alaska La Airlines. And what they were deciding was, should a mechanic be reinstated after he was fired following a positive test for marijuana? And so in this particular case, that board, that arbitration board concluded that the individual should be reinstated, even though he tested positive for marijuana. And the reason they decided this was because the employee admitted that he uh, accidentally consumed marijuana, accidentally consumed marijuana at a friend's barbecue the day before on a Sunday. And so that's why he had a positive test for marijuana. That sounds to me like the stories I used to hear. I don't smoke marijuana. I was just in the car. Somebody else was smoking it. Um, and, and I just happened to be in the car. It wasn't me. Yep, that's exactly right. Well, Phil, you and I have spent a lot of time. We've, we've had... Uh, Missouri State uh, Master Sergeant, uh, patrolman or a highway patrol member, uh, Tyler Jenkins. We've done a lot of training for our member, for your members, for my clients uh, on, on indicia of impairment. And the standard under most of these states' laws is that whether somebody tests positive for marijuana or not, that's not necessarily dispositive of the issue. It doesn't mean that the person is under the influence of marijuana. Uh, because the way mar marijuana metabolizes in the system, you could have consumed it quite a while ago. It's still in your system, but you are not necessarily impaired. And those states laws say that you cannot be impaired at work. And I think in this case, things might have been a little bit different if the employer could have shown that the employee was actually impaired at work. The employee got caught on a random drug test and there was no there there were there was no evidence that the employee was actually impaired at work, and so I think that gets back to all of the training that we've done with our with your members with our clients uh, that people really do need to be educated on these indicia of impairment in order to make a discharge stick uh, for somebody who gets caught on a positive marijuana test. You need, so, so you need Bert, that I got, something more. I just have a few questions. I still don't know why you think I would like this one. However, um, I do have some questions for our audience. Uh, first is, so the person was um, tested positive on a random test. There was no suspicion of impairment. Um, and the person was discharged and then reinstated. That is uh, correct. Right. So now the questions haven't come in on the text line. I do have some other ones here, but uh, that question I would assume means, so does that mean I um, should be doing indicia of impairment when I do my random or what's the purpose of the random? Can I still discharge people? And, and I think that's the space that we're in today where it's, it's very, very difficult to, you know, to make those types of policies stick 
when we have a, a mix match of, you know, marijuana is legal, mar medical marijuana is legal, uh, it's not legal. Um, we're in a, a kind of a no man's land here. We are, and I think that's where it really becomes important because uh, the, the, under the, whether it's recreational or medicinal, uh, the individual st still does not have the right to be under the influence at work. And the only true way to uh, make that determination, I think, is the, are those indicia of impairment, those yeah. indicators of impairment combined with the test. My understanding is, is that there is a relatively new resource out there that may measure uh, help measure impairment uh, by marijuana, a, a technical device, but uh, it has not been tested in court yet to see if it uh, would pass muster with a with a with a judge. Yeah, well, that will be a golden ticket uh, once that comes out. Uh, yes. But until then, should you need some help, Bert and I are always happy to to reach out and help. Uh, this is an area that we've done a lot of training on to, to help employers determine that up to and including uh Bert, we, we like to bring impaired people to the program and 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 do testing on someone who is impaired um i want to go to the chat line here real quick uh bert um our long time from the beginning uh listener and he likes to interact dave forcey um is uh, made a comment that his favorite uh, episode was when you had to provide legal representation for your Huskies uh, uh, because they got out uh, in your neighborhood. And I think you had a, a tracking collar and had some problems. And this was one day when your Huskies took a hike. Yeah, but Huskies took a hike and ended up about a mile away after about two minutes. And uh, they, they proceeded to... Um, Gosh, it's still hard to talk about massacre uh, somebody's chickens in their neighbor in their neighborhood, <laughs> and uh, yes, so so that was that was a tense situation. Luckily, the uh, the neighbor ended up being very gracious about it, and uh, my my dogs uh, ha have not killed anybody's chickens in a couple of years now. Yeah, you just bring them over some rotisserie replacement chickens. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that <laughs> reminder, Dave. <laughs> hey. Um, but that just goes to show you, people are listening to the strangest things that we talk about. I don't know about you, um, Bert, but I just want to show, show three episode 300. I have 300 little donut um, holes here uh, that were brought in by uh, Nick and uh, Team Fred over there, feature group. Uh, you got your your little care package delivered this morning. I did, uh, Phil. I got I got bagels and cream cheese. I think that says something about the health that you and I uh, uh, yeah. follow. Well, hey, you just keep looking at that um, Spartan picture, episode 300, right? That's <laughs> that's what we have in our mind, Bert. Exactly. All right. Anything else uh, from Lawyer on the Clock? No, I think we've got it. We want to get to uh, all the good stuff Tanya has to share. All right. Well, Tanya, welcome back to the program. This is what, part three of our three-part series, and we're going to talk about mentorship burnout a little bit. Um, so we're happy to, to have you back. Um, we get so much praise about your contributions to the program. So thank you for being a part of it. Um, what is it that's bringing this topic to the forefront for us? Yeah, so when we're doing these employee opinion and engagement surveys, we're talking about a lot of things throughout the organization. And oftentimes the things that come up are the differences in the generations, right? How to manage that? How can we empower our supervisors to really show up the way that some of the emerging leaders in the organization need? And so what I'm hearing from a lot of people is they, the newest hires across a variety of industries. So I can't even say this is isolated to, to an industry, but those Gen Z workers are really looking for a lot of feedback. So they're wanting daily touch points. They're wanting hourly touch points sometimes. And I'm talking to a lot of supervisors that are like, how do I manage this? It's somewhat exhausting. And then what I'm also hearing is it's not about work, right? Um, Gen Z's value transparency. They value authenticity. And so often they're bringing to their mentor at work a lot of things from their personal life and their families. And so I've been you know, I don't know if they really value authenticity, because <laughs> if I was to say what I was really thinking sometimes, I'm not sure that they would go, that's really good and valuable to me. They might really think uh, that, that that doesn't really align with what they want to hear. 
Well, you would be in um, you would be in good company. So there's been some studies done on this and talking about how easy it is to work with different generations in the workplace. And the Gen Zs are rated um, as some of the most difficult, even by themselves. So, <laughs> Bill, when I talk about authenticity and transparency, they have a need to show up authentic and transparent. And sometimes oh, just okay. skills that they don't have or maybe how to receive that feedback and authenticity back. And so that's some skill development that we need to do. So I know you're, you're doing a lot with our members and you're working with the emerging leaders and new generations. What is it that, that uh, you would like to highlight in what you're hearing about young Gen Z emerging leaders, uh, maybe the younger millennial emerging leaders and the, the type of impact that's having in the workplace? Well, the first thing we have to acknowledge, and I think there's some listeners to the program that when we think about emerging leaders, they're thinking about those millennials, right? I think so much was made about the millennial generation when they hit the workplace, but really we're up to like 14, 15% of the workplace right now is Gen Z as well. And so recognizing that and, and knowing that that is happening is, is the first. Um, and the second is they just approach work differently, right? If I would have a conversation with a boomer or a silent generation, there was something about our identity. Identity, right? The job that we had that like made you a good member of society. You went to work, you put in your dues, um, you worked hard, and then you were promoted throughout. What we know about the Gen Zs is they're not as hierarchical. Um, and I was kind of thinking about this preparing for the show. You know, when I was growing up, and Phil, I'm almost certain, probably Bert too, when we asked our parents something that we didn't understand, what did our parents tell us? Don't worry about it because I said so, right? Like, I think right. that was a generational thing because I said so. And I don't know about you guys, but when I parented, like, I actually strove to never say that to my kids, right? I never wanted to give them the answer because I said so. I informed them. I tried to give them information. And I think if we study those, that generation, that's pretty typical. So I think in the workplace, there used to be this idea that I'm doing it because my boss told me. But what we're seeing in the workplace now is this focus on why are we doing it? You know, what's the purpose? How does it tie into the overall goals of the organization? And I think sometimes supervisors haven't ever had to go to that depth or that level. And so even out of the C-suite, there's a lot of confusion of how much do we share and what do we share? And on the other end is the Gen Z saying, connect me back to a purpose at work because I'm here to get a paycheck unless you can show me how the work I'm doing contributes to the whole. Yeah. You know that when you're saying connect me back to a purpose, um, and I know in working with, you know, some of the folks that come through our leadership programs or working with different organizations, um, and um, one thing that comes out that makes it hard, I think, is for business owners to really articulate what is the purpose of one of many people who work in a production environment, maybe per se, and you know what they're doing. And, and it just, it's one piece of something much larger and it's hard to articulate. Are you finding that that is causing any fatigue in the workplace? It is because, you know, the emerging leaders are asking why, why do we do it this way? Why is it this way? And if the organization as a whole hasn't defined that, then your supervisors aren't going to be well prepared to answer that. And so that's my message to every organization is you have to have clarity of why you exist in the marketplace. And then the more clarity that you can have as to why each role respond, like, um, that supports that mission, that's what's really, really important because then I can, as an individual contributor, say, you know what? I made 100 widgets today, but our goal today was 2,000. And so without my 100, we wouldn't have made our goal. Or perhaps it's customer service, right? And how quickly do we answer that call? And how do we have an overall satisfaction rating? Those things really matter. And I think oftentimes we have a tendency as, as leaders to overlook the importance of really breaking that down. Yeah. The hardest thing for me, and I know you do a lot of coaching and you you get very close with some of our members and working with their leadership team. But the hardest thing for me is to get leaders to recognize 
how important this is. Um, we just had a round table the other day, uh, I guess it was Tuesday, and I don't know, there was maybe 35, 40 in the group, and we were discussing performance management and the things we used to do in performance management versus the things we would like to do. And we're, st we're somewhere in between the ideal scenario and once a year performance reviews. Um, and it really became evident that the skills and the ability or the, uh, it wasn't really intent to understand, but it's, you know, that's not what I need. I'm more of an engineering minded person. I kind of work more by the numbers and, you know, language and communication and empathy don't come out as easily for me as they would for someone else. Um, mm -hmm. And the great comparison was that, you know, the group of HR professionals are like, well, you you know, they should want to talk to their people. They should want to do these things. It's easy. Just have a conversation with them. This was kind of the road we went down, which is all logical. But if you say, well, yeah, but if we were asking you to do math and engineering solutions, it's all logical. You should be able to do that as easily as anyone else. And it really does come down to a skill set. I mean, we can learn these skills. Some might be more natural at it than other, but it does come down to skill set. What is it that you do to help the skill enhancement um, for individuals that it doesn't come as natural to? Yeah, I think this is a great point. And the first thing that we have to recognize is that we do all have different personalities, right? Like we do a lot of work in assessments so that we you know that because we work with Bert every week. So yes. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes, yeah, that personality comes up, changes constantly. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you guys, we could just study your dynamic for a long time. Um, no, but we do a lot of assessments at AIM so that you can get an understanding of just how you're naturally wired, right? And so we use those assessments as a foundation to say there's not a right or wrong personality. But to your point, if maybe language isn't something that just comes naturally, maybe you're naturally more introverted, then what we have to figure out is how do we create space for you to start some of those conversations and build relationships? And this isn't an engineering example, but it's IT. And so I think it maybe fits is, you know, in team meetings to get their people talking, um, they have like each person brings a funny meme to the meeting. Right. And that's how they break down some of those walls of communication. So other Nick people would be I really think, good in that environment. He, I mean, he's always putting these things together. I know we have good representation of what different people need. Right. But so I think we have to get creative on how, because really overall, what we're trying to do as leaders of any organization is we're trying to serve out the purpose of that organization. And we can't do it by ourselves, right? There's too many tasks to get done. We have to have employees. And if we're gonna bring employees into our organization, then how do we work to create this sense of belonging that everyone has purpose, every job is tied back to the mission of the organization. And then we're able to wrap some, you know, some key metrics around that so that people can measure, am I doing a good job or not? And I think before we maybe had some generations, very globally speaking, that you, we knew we came to work and we worked hard and we got a paycheck. And these younger emerging leaders are saying, tell me why, because why do we do it this way? It seems like this would be way easier or I don't understand why I have to follow these processes. And I think a lot of business owners are getting caught because they don't have a really good answer to that. It's the way we've always done it. And so the more the organization knows what current state is and then is open to feedback and ideas, the more engaged your emerging leaders are going to be. Yeah. And, you know, just one last kind of comment that I, where I see some businesses get stuck very frequently is when the owner or the most senior leader is in the mindset of, and it's a very dangerous mindset, well, that's not how I did it. That's not what it was like for me, or that's not how you learn the job. It's, I mean, it is different today, whether we like it or not, we have to be wise enough to recognize that, that the environment around us is changing, and particularly as it relates to our talent, talent expectations um, and, that is a hurdle I find really difficult to get over. Even with data and information, it's just the mindset that, no, that's not how someone should do it, or you should have to spend more time doing a particular job. And, you know, the younger generation wants to advance more quickly than, you know, is more in the reasonable mindset of that leader. 
Yeah, that's really a lot of what we've been doing in our generation workshop, right? So we talk about that and we talk about the experiences that we have. I mean, Bert maybe can relate to this, the changes even in labor law, right? It, over the last 50 years. Yeah. And so somebody that was in the workplace 50 years ago had no expectation of some of the rights that employees are given today because it didn't exist. But why would we expect some of the, you know, the newest people to the workforce to not expect to have those rights because that existed when they entered into the workplace. And so I think being able to flex that that understanding and understand that your view isn't the only view is the quickest way you can start to break down barriers. You have to be willing to accept what is and figure out how you take that and utilize it in your workplace. And yeah, a couple of comments there. The first of all, I, I think the, the 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 most prominent example I, that immediately comes to mind of a workplace right that's there today that uh, never used to be there, paternity leave. That whole right. concept. I mean, that is oh, yeah. something that literally did not exist. And uh, you know, when 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 my kids were born, I was I was back at work the next day. Uh, I think I even went in uh, that night. Uh, to catch up on a few things after the baby was born. And, uh, you know, so the whole concept of, of a male employee taking weeks or months off uh, because uh, they, they had a child is, is really a new concept and something that takes getting used to. The other thing I, I, I do want to point out here is, uh, you know, we talk about in terms of the discrimination laws that uh, we, we should never really just generalize across an entire category of people. And that goes with respect to the generations out there too. And so we talk a lot about Gen Z, uh, not everyone's the same way within each generation. And uh, there are what I consider to be standouts out there who uh, sort of are what I would call more old school these days that uh, have have a good work ethic. They get it. They understand it. They don't question uh, everything that goes on. They realize that they're there to learn uh, and that uh, people before them have sort of paved the way for some of this. And they don't need to figure everything out uh, or know the why to everything. They'll learn that as they go along. So there, we, we, we need to be careful when we generalize. Absolutely. I'm but so it's more fun to that. generalize, Bert. No, we're just going to throw them in one bucket here. It's more <laughs> Perfect, fun to Jill. generalize. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I think Bert's point is very well taken. And I think that's the thing is we need to understand the experience, right? And the reason we can classify some things by generation is there was a shared experience. But that doesn't mean that everybody takes the same thing away from it. And so, but I think this is really doubling down on the point we're making is that we are really requiring our supervisors to get to know the employees that are on their team and understand their talents, understand the way they want to be recognized. And I think you know, understanding that one size doesn't fit all, but also having the ability to Flex and understand that how they came in the door and the experiences that they have probably differed pretty greatly from what you had in your experience through school or what you were exposed to prior to coming into the workplace. And so I absolutely agree. Everyone wants to feel individualized and understanding that um, maybe more so in this latest generation than ever. And I think the good news is a lot of these skills that we're talking about, we can help people get these skills, right? We can work with organizations to identify the purpose. And even if you outsource your mentorship, which I really advise you to do, if you don't have good mentors in your organization, outsource that to a group that does. And a good mentorship program, even outsourced from the organization, can talk about, well, what's your organization? mission? What are these things? And so we can help skill development so that when they are in the workplace, they bring some of those skills to what they're doing and the relationships they have. Yeah, those are some excellent points, Tanya. Thank you uh, for joining us. Nick, are we able to take a look at the poll results? I think that's important to uh, look at here as we close out. I'm curious what people have enjoyed the most over the years. Yeah, we have it up there, and it looks like Corona the Squirrel is in the lead. I I kind of had a feeling that the Corona Squirrel was gonna was gonna take a, the lead on that. That's uh, what what's that at number two there? Number two is Bert broadcasting from Jerusalem, and that's uh, very special. Yeah, it's no, special, that was special, but not quite as special as Monique getting high on the <laughs> <Yeah>. show. <laughs> I think well, that's not tell us a Monique lot about we, our listeners. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. But hey, um, times are changing. Uh, so that, that's good. Now we're talking about artificial intelligence that's under the influence. Um, so that that's where we're going. Anyway, uh, Bert, I got to just say, 
personally, I'm I'm so happy to work and have a partner like you on a program like this. I know that uh, I get constant feedback um, from what's over, you know, 30,000 listeners now uh, to the program uh, on how much they enjoy your segment and uh, the lawyer on the clock segment. And Tanya, um, we have you back so frequently because we get such good feedback on the things that you're doing. And internally, I know the wonderful work that you do with uh, when they're um, brave enough to allow you in to help them improve. So I appreciate all the things you do each and every day for us here at AIM. But producer Nick, behind the scenes, you make it all happen. And I appreciate you and all the things that you do to um, help Bert and I look good. Yep. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you for the donuts as well, because I'm going to enjoy those here in just a little bit. But until then, uh, let me just share a couple things that we have uh, going on. We got our annual payroll tax update. This is something like 35, 38th year of our payroll tax. If you have a payroll um, uh, individual working in your business, this is the right program for them. There's not many programs you can send them to to stay abreast of all the changes uh, in payroll and make sure that we're doing things the right way. And that's what this program is designed to do. You can attend in person or online. Um, and then we have our exempt versus non-exempt Bert. I don't know if this looks familiar to you, but that's coming up, let's see, on October 30th, the day before Halloween, trick or treat. Um, and Bert, you're going to be leading that program for us. Um, and I know that's uh, very well attended. There are still seats available online um, and we may be able to squeeze somebody in in person. I know I think we may have a, lady, a waiting list for that. So um, looking really forward to uh, seeing our members at one of those two events. Until then, let's go out and be good to someone. Thank you for joining. Thank you once again. For for tuning in to This Week at Work. If you enjoy the show, please share it with your colleagues. Forward our invites. Share the link, aimea.org forward slash This Week at Work, or follow or subscribe wherever you get your news and entertainment. LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we're everywhere you are. Don't forget you can be part of the show. Send your questions and comments anytime to info at thisweek.work. See you next week, 7.30 a.m. Central Time, when we discuss what's happening this week at work.